All right. So again, welcome to this joint meeting with uh, the Federal Cores and Podband teams. Um, the first thing, so of course this is recorded. Um, we'll try and use the raise hand feature uh, from Google Meet. Uh, so please try to use that to speak uh, and we'll guide the conversation with Clément. Um, remember that, uh, yeah, this, this, uh, this meeting should be a place for high bandwidth discussions. Uh, we are not planning on taking final decisions here. At the federal Congress, uh, decision process uh, usually takes place during federal Congress meetings. So, uh, if um, if uh, yeah, if there are things that we cannot discuss here, or if we don't have time or anything, um, feel free to read that into tickets into the federal Congress tracker. Um, as we have a lot of topics uh, on on the agenda, we'll try to keep that into 10 to 15 minute slots. Uh, and uh, of course, if we don't cover some, uh, we'll, we'll maybe do that again or, or we'll see. Um, yeah, that should cover most of the of the thing. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining. I'll let Dan speak first. Okay, so uh, the Podman team has been um, working a lot on a solution where uh, really, really, what we've been sort of concentrating on is, is Podman on Mac. Um, so, it, you know, we basically have got most of the features that Docker has at this point, and the last big advantage of Docker has over Podman is their Mac support. So uh, we've understood that for a while, and we've had um, Podman for Mac for a while, um, but when you use Podman on Mac, we make you have to have a Linux box somewhere, so similar to what Docker does. Um, but you have to have a Linux box that you can connect, connect to. Um, so one of the goals was to basically allow you to uh, use it on a Mac and be able to execute the Podman commands. You come up and say, you know, you need a Linux box, and now, you know, what, what does the user do? And so our solution to that has been basically looking around for a VM to, uh, or a standard VM to just pull on behalf of the user. And we've gone back and forth. We looked at CRC. We've looked at uh, uh, some community members have done things like Podman Machine and um, built on Tiny Linux and and different solutions have come up like that. But what we really want to do is we want to inter you know because we're basically a core a Fedora project. We wanted to use the con the container platform for Fedora, which is Fedora Core OS. Um, and so uh, we've actually wrapped. Uh, um, basically Podman now, Podman has a command called Podman machine and you do a Podman machine create and it goes out and it grabs the Fedora core OS image and brings it down to, um, to the, the Mac and starts running it. We also want Podman machine to work on, on top of a, a Linux box and maybe eventually on top of a windows box as well. Um, so the basic idea is to, to pull the Fedora core OS image and then, um, uh, for those that don't know, Podman has a um, a fairly new what we call API v2, which is a, a remote API that allows us to run containers uh, remotely. Um, so it's a, a REST API. And so Podman on the Mac would be communicating with Podman inside of Fedora Core OS to actually launch all of the containers. Um, so as we've worked with Fedora Core OS, we have have some decent problems with it. Uh, probably the biggest one right now is that Fedora Core OS does not default to Seagrus V2. Um, and we think that, you know, we think that's a colossal uh, problem um, at this point because we want, you know, I desperately want Seagrus V1 to die as fast as, you know, Rel 8 goes away. Uh, but uh, the, the so uh, that, that would be our issue number one is getting Fedora to switch to Fedora Core OS to switch to C Groups V2 by default. Um, second issue we have right now is we want to support both uh, um, running on top of x86 as well as the new Macs would run on top of ARM. And there is a Fedora Core OS for ARM, but right now it's not compressed. So we want to know, you know, is that uh, is there a reason that the version of Fedora Core OS is not compressed by default? Um, and then the third issue is we want Fedora Core OS to uh, go on a diet. And we think at this point that having Fedora Core OS ship with both Podman and Mobi Engine 
is really duplicating code and Mobi just removing Mobi Engine for, for our core OS removes about 200 uh, megabytes of, of storage. And we believe that Podman can implement um, just about it, everything that Docker can do on, on a platform. And we can run, if you install Podman Docker, which just sets it up in, in Docker mode to be able to support the remote API. And if anybody wants to run Docker commands, it would work. Um, but that would make, I mean, the, the problem right now is it's uh, Fedora Core OS is, I think, about uh, nearly two gigabytes in size. So when we're pulling it down, the, the initial user experience on the Mac is not great if it takes, you know, minutes to pull down the image. So I think, Ashley, do you have any other? Uh, Brent Body and Ashley are working on this, and Brent's not, uh, wasn't able to attend. But Ashley, anything else? Um, I think that basically covers uh, it from what I said. Um, but yeah. So I guess at this point, we have a discussion. Uh, everybody just uh, says, again, yes, Walsh's voice is, is great, and we'll just do it. It's <laughs> really what I want. Yeah. Yeah, you, you brought up a lot of points. Um, like, I think one thing around messaging, like the C groups V1, is you know it's a default, um, and certainly for this use case, like, be pretty easy to uh, edit. Like, you can create an ignition config today that changes that default. That would mean an additional reboot the first time a machine is is you know started, um, which I can't imagine would be too bad of a hit. Like, it's a little bit of latency, but you know, if if we want to mitigate yeah, that. Why, issue, why? Fedora has been defaulted to C groups v2 for since Fedora 33, which is a year and something. Fedora right. 33 is about to go. Fedora Core OS is supposed to be, you know, what the future of, of containers is, and and why is it stuck here? And this one, forgetting about Podman issue, this just drives me crazy that we're not you guys on a C groups v2 at this point. Right. These yeah. well, right. All your issues are interconnected, and the reason for that default right is that we ship Mobi, which doesn't support this, right? Yeah, and so Moby, and by the way, Docker Upstream does support it. So I don't know why Moby doesn't support it. Um, so it's, yeah. All right, Benjamin, go ahead. So on the C groups V1 issue, uh, I'm, not, I'm not up to date on the current state. I know that there's a plan to switch to it, and maybe one of the other FCOS folks here can, can speak to that. Um, so there are a couple of things. The reason we were on C groups V1 is that Fedora switched over to V2, like intentionally, if you read the change proposal, before everything was ready. And we have user support, right? And so we, we wanted to make sure to hold back on V1 until uh, all the software that cared was, was updated. So that's why we're, we're there. Um, one, so as I said, someone else can speak to the, the timing, but one other option is that we are working on adding kernel argument support to Ignition. And so if that happens to land before the C groups V2 change lands, uh, you could use that when, when uh, provisioning your uh, Podman Mac VM to switch uh, FCOS over to V2, even if that's not the default. So and and at this without point, a reboot? So I, I, you know, without a reboot would be great, but I still, I, I, forgetting about the Podman issue, what project doesn't support secrets v2 kubernetes supports it at this point a, a properly yeah. maintained Can version of docker c does yes yes does uh, yeah I, I think what we were waiting on was uh essentially kubernetes to have support which it does now um and then also moby engine to have support which it does now in fedora 34. so i think we were hoping to switch over in fedora 34 but i've also been away for over two months, and I'm not sure of the current status on that. Um, but yeah, we we were hoping to move to it as soon as we could. So I, I think we're we're approaching your goal on that one. Stephen, go ahead. Um, I was going to say on the ignition K args one, um, there there technically is a reboot, but it happens so early in the init RD, it's effectively not a reboot. Like we're happening, it would happen right after. Ignition fetches its config and then applies the k-args, and then it would immediately reboot. Um, so you never leave the initRD before the reboot happens. So 
Um, I don't think any other hands are on, on speak. The, I think the C group V2 is going to happen for Fedora 34 unless we find any major issue. So that should, which Fedora 34 is coming in like really short time frame. So uh, that should be fixed like really, really soon. Um, so I, I guess I'll jump in real quick with, um, I know that you mentioned size, uh, and as a reason to potentially drop Moby, is there, is there a world where we should like, we should basically drop all container <laughs> runtimes and then just have a extension build in that pulls in Docker or in this case, I guess, Moby, since they can't use the official one or podman or cryo at a specific version and and we trim the image by that much more like three times sorry benjamin i think before we switch to that are we happy with c group v2 i think the the final word was that it's going to happen in the f34 time frame to the switch to f34 Okay, so Fedora, Car to Fedora Car OS will ship simultaneously with Fedora 34. No. In a close, well, really close time frame. We don't, uh, we don't have the exact same. Uh, we don't release on the same day, but um, we we try. We will test the Fedora 34 content, and and we'll try to re to rebase. We 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 have a stream to rebase on that uh, ready, and and we'll do the switch. Uh, hopefully shortly after the release. So we're, we're actually rebasing the, the next stream right now. So in the next set of releases, uh, you should be able to use the next stream uh, and uh, which, well, I guess that doesn't automatically gives us secrets V2, but we could make that happen so that it happens in the next stream first. Yeah, the summary there, Dan, is basically we don't switch our stable stream on the exact day that Fedora 34 is released, but there is another less quote unquote stable stream that you can use um, that will have the, the Fedora 34 content. And, you know, if we're switching to Cgroups v2, that will have Cgroups v2 as the default. So that would be available on Fedora 34 release day. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Brent, Brent has joined us. Brent, um, where are you grabbing the Fedora Core OS image from? Um, for Intel, I'm grabbing it uh, directly from the download their download page, but I am using the next stream. And then for AR64, I'm grabbing it from, I think, the only place that's available, um, which is a side location done by one of the probably one of the folks on this call, maybe. Those are the two locations. Okay. All right. So and there, uh, it, I think it's already next stream. Like, I think the AR64 is already following the, the next stream, I think. So this is the next topic, which is AR34 support. And so as you've discovered, we don't have full ARCH64 support right now. And I think we have Jakub here. We maybe he can give us an update on the status of that work for Fedora Chorus. But from my side, I'm, I'm still in the same spot that I'm building it locally uh, on hardware that I have available and pushing it to Fedora people. Uh, I got a bit uh, distracted by uh, other issues in the past weeks, and uh, I will be also on PTO next week, so I will not be looking into it directly and don't expect much progress for the next week, unfortunately. Uh, but I plan to continue working on it as I'm uh, currently onboarding onto the infra of the CoreOS and trying to look all into all the all the, all the the work that would need to be done there. And hopefully make it official, others do not object. Yep, and I'll be back next week as well, uh, so I can, me and Jacob can kind of work on it together. As a consumer of it, I just let you guys know that I've had no problems with it, the images. 
other than uncompressed downloads and the metadata download metadata not being present. Cool. I'm working on Brent. the compression side at the moment. Yeah. Brent, before you got here, um, uh, Stephen pointed out that you can actually reboot into Sequence V2 um, fairly seamlessly or hid hidden from the user. Um, via the ignition script. So we might want to investigate that I, further. Dan, that has not that. landed yet. It should land pretty soon. Yeah. Okay. I did hear that, I and I heard that. that it would be soon. OK. Yeah. Very well. And the Fedora 34 time frame lines up with probably a, a better approximation of when we'd really be pushing Podman machine out. So. Correct. And frankly, I'm fine with the ARCH. I mean, Dan, I don't know how you feel, but if for two months, ARCH is in a side location, I, as long as it's available, I can't say that's necessarily a bad thing. The, the only problem there is is that we have to have that coded into Podman, right? That location. Yeah, but that lo if that location if, goes away, then we're in trouble. We don't, I don't know if they want to ship in that location forever. Uh, the forever. Fair enough. Yeah. There's probably also the other issue. It's not a CDN, right? So uh, right. people around the world may have wildly varying download experience. But I think for Podman on Mac, I think we're going to see this image becomes much more popular as time goes by because obviously Mac is switching their default to that. Benjamin, you want to go next? Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Sure. So in the short term, if getting those images compressed uh, would help unblock you, uh, Jacob, that should just be a fairly small change to the pipeline. I, uh, is that something that we could do? And then uh, the other thing I wanted to check, uh, Brent, was that you were using, when you say you're getting the x86 image from the download page, uh, is Podman actually fetching stream metadata and going through that whole process? Correct. Yeah, for me, for me, I was blocked on the, on uh, infra issues that were mostly blocking me for the, doing like regular push. Like I most probably can push actually everything except AR64 for whatever reason. I have issues with the builder at the moment, where it was issue with the storage. And yeah, I'm working on it. Hopefully, it will be fixed. I hoped it it been done by Friday, but unfortunately, there were unforeseen issues that I had. Okay, Dalton. I was wondering if this covers the AWS AMIs. I've been publishing AMIs publicly for a couple months now, but I would love to stop doing that since I'm not in any way affiliated. <laughs> Dalton, are you referring to ARCH64 AWS AMIs? Okay. Yeah, I've been publishing those and using them, but would love a more official version. Is that the same pipeline? Yeah. Yeah, I think we would, once we had official AR64 images, we'd probably want to create appropriate AMIs for them as well. Jonathan? Yeah, in the short term, we could, uh, you could push the, uh, I'm talking to Jacob, uh, you could push the uh, AR64 bits to uh, the same bucket that we use. We have like a slash devel uh, top directory. So, you know, uh, it can be semi-stable, and at least it's on a, a CDN. So, uh, yeah, so Podman could could hook into that. Sure, uh, but I'm I, I don't think I, I have yet access. I have not yet requested access for the federal core side of the infrastructure. Yeah, we can well, we can we can do that offline. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Dalton again. You still have your in, yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay, <laughs> no worries. All right. Um, so H thirty four is in progress. Do we have anything else to talk about here? 
about that. Uh, Colleen, yeah. Uh, I was actually going to move on to a different topic, but uh, yeah. it was kind of related to this. If that's, that's okay, real quick. So I, I know we talked about this before, but uh, are in place updates in scope for this? Like, are today is the Podman tool injecting ignition to disable Zincati, or, or are we planning that basically the user experience would be, you know, they use Podman machine and then they spin up the machine, but then like, Instead of having like a, a command to like redown the image, and they they instead just do like the in place OS3 updates and you know like pull container images in place, or or are you thinking it more be like the latter? Like is it would it be stateless or or kind of like a hybrid where like last I looked at the Docker one they explicitly created a separate writable data store, but then just blew away the OS image. Like have, is there a plan for the which of those approaches? My plan I, I was. To to talk to, to Colin about it. <laughs> exactly. We want we want you to decide that, not us. I mean, yeah. I think we give you some basic ideas and then take your advice. Um, yeah, yeah. I, mean, no, I, mean, I think okay, one of our goals one of our goals is to to show the power of, of Fedora Core OS. So it's not, you know, we we don't want. We don't want to over-engineer what Podman does, right? So if CoreOS can manage its lifecycle, that would be great. Right. The reason the reason I bring this up is like it's kind of related to your topics around shrinking the image and other stuff, right? Like to me, one of the most valuable things about Fedora CoreOS is that like stream metadata JSON. It's like we have tested this OS, we've booted it in a bunch of different places, we've simulated installing it on bare metal, we've tested this whole thing together, right? And so um, we want that to apply, apply to a variety of use cases, right? Whereas today, you could just take our configs and build your own FCOS and host however you want, right? But then then you like, oh, in the build, testing, delivery infrastructure, right? Um, right? And so, yeah, and if you do that, then you also need to think about how you handle updates, right? So like, a valuable point of F Fedora CoreOS is definitely like in, this, in a scenario like this, as well as you know, production, cloud scenario, you can do in-place updates pretty cheaply and keep your existing data. But um, yeah, it, yeah, it's it's an important aspect of this, right? Because I, I think, I mean, definitely one thing, you know, you'll notice if you use Fedora course for a little bit is like right now, sometimes the node will just reboot while you're like SSH in or something, right? And like, so you have to think about that. Um, I mean, to me, this is like good, but, uh, you know, do you want to have the Podman command at least like have basic control over Zincati or something like that, maybe. Because it, it can be a non-trivial amount of data to download, and some users may be on metered connections. So whatever you'll do, I, I basically, I would file an issue about this and just come up with a stub plan, which could be we'll do in-place updates. Um, right. Work it out from there. I, I, yeah. I would like, I mean, in my opinion, we, we deal with that when the people complain about it. Um, and you know, but yes, your other comment about us managing an operating system, that that's a definitely no. That's been, you know, we're, we, we're not going to be in the operating system. The Podman team is not going to be in the operating system business, so. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is a little bit of a special corner use case of Fedora Core OS, which is like you, you're not necessarily running like a server application that needs to be up all the time and people are connecting to it. Basically, you're you're running a development workflow for people, right? And um, you know, while you're up and developing and you're interacting with it, you don't want it to go down, right? So like the fact that we have automated updates that happen, um, you know, you can schedule them or whatnot it seems like that's not necessarily something you want to do. Um, like, you know, you don't want to be in the middle of development for somebody and their machine go down or their Podman backend machine go down. Um, so it seems like you would want to treat it slightly differently. And you could even have the approach of like, I don't know, at the top level what you could run, but you could say Podman OS update and it actually talks to the backend machine and actually will run an update. Um, or you could just say Podman OS replace, and it basically will reach out, see what the latest version is, grab the brand new image, and give you a brand new VM rather than yeah. updating yeah. it in place. 
Yeah, see, so like, I don't, I, you, I don't like, I don't like your suggestion there because you're, you're figuring a human being knows what the hell he's doing, and <laughs> I, I don't believe, you know, anybody's going to be, yeah, <laughs> is going to realize that it needs to be updated, right? So I don't want the thing to be three years old and they're still using it, right? Right. So yeah. I, I would, in a perfect world, I would have the thing update itself but not reboot, and then. When Podman shuts it down, you know, anytime Podman shuts it down, which a user is going to do, right? He's going to have a Podman down command to take the thing down, and when it boots back up, it would boot up with the new new version. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, that would be the, that way. The use the user is out of the update business, but it's not randomly shutting down on them. Go ahead, Jeff. So, as the user who's probably going to complain to both teams about this down the road. Um, I'd like to kind of plant the flag of um, it, it would be really nice to uh, either have uh, Zincati send a message to Podman or Podman pick up a status from Zincati that says, hey, there is a new update available and show that as a line when you send a Podman command, right? Um, I don't know that that exists today. I, I don't want to presuppose that this has all been thought through. I, I, I kind of doubt it. But I, my use case is going to be that once every six months, I'm going to try and spin up some containers on my FCOS that's on my Mac. And um, I'm going to hope that it succeeds. But if it doesn't, I would like it to tell me, um, hey, you could use updating your machine. And a Podman machine update is something I'm perfectly willing to run if something tells me to. And I would prefer to find out from Podman in that case. So when we get an issue together and start iterating on it, I, I'd love to provide some feedback on it. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, and I think Steven even suggested, oh, we could even propose tying a particular FCOS version to the version of Podman that's running, right? So on the host, on Mac, you know that this version of Podman was tested with FCOS version XYZ. Right. And if it doesn't match, you maybe give the user a message and say, hey, this version was tested with that. You might want to consider updating or something right. along those lines. But like Jeff said, there's a lot of options here. We should probably definitely talk about that yeah. user experience when we get there. I think over time, we're going to figure those out. You know? And we're, the Podman team is going to have to be real good about, you know, version control. You know, that older versions of Podman can work with newer versions and vice versa. All right. Um, do we have anything else on the update front? Update topic. I don't see any hands raised. So, should we move to um, the um, reducing the size of Fedora Chorus topic? Benjamin. Yeah, so I just want to frame a bit um, so that everyone's on the same page, uh, sort of what our overall goals are for FCOS. So we're concerned about the OKD use case. We're concerned about the Kubernetes use case for people who want to run other di distros of Kubernetes. We're concerned about people who don't want to run Kubernetes. Uh, we want to support people who want to run Podman. We want to support people who want to run Docker. Um, we originally had a model where everything should ship sort of unified with the OS. And unfortunately, that didn't work um, for Cryo anyway. Uh, we've been adding some infrastructure to allow sort of pulling in additional uh, uh, packages in, in fairly restricted cases. And so I think that's smoother than it used to be. But it's not clear to me anyway that we should sort of move more in that direction than we need to, because it's nice to have an out-of-the-box experience for users that works for as many container use cases as possible. Uh, we want people who want to run containers to, to use FCOS no matter, no matter what ecosystem they're, they're accustomed to and how they want to do it. Um, and so like that's, I think that's where the team's thinking has been up to this point. As far as size, therefore, um, I think, at least in the back of our minds, we've been thinking more in terms of um, like reducing unnecessary dependencies being pulled in rather than the size of the core components that people actually want to run if they're, if they're running FCOS. Yeah. Um, so that's my perspective, and I'm interested in, in if other folks on the team have a different view. You know, please take I I would just say that would work if if GoLang wasn't the fattest thing on the planet, 
and and the more Golang container things we shove in there, the fatter and fatter it gets. As I said, Brent did an experiment yesterday and removed just Docker, just Moby Engine and Run C, and he eliminated about 20% of the size of Fedora Core OS. And that just Moby container, it, Moby brings in, Moby it brings in the Docker command, Docker C, uh, D, container D, and run C. Each one of those is a massive Go program that is at least 20 megabytes to 50 megabytes, each one of those. Yeah, yeah and, I mean, and yeah, unfortunately, it is definitely large. Um, I think when you consider the original goal of Fedora Core OS, which was to try to maintain some continuity for existing container Linux users uh, who had, you know, Docker slash Moby Engine and Rocket, um, you know, Rocket was not the most commonly used. So we ended up just kind of pulling forward the Docker piece of it, but that's a huge piece. And I think if we were to try to remove it now or make it like something that's just added on secondary, it would, you know, it. I don't think it'd be very good for those people who decided to take the journey with us and, and move over to Fedora Core OS. Um, you know, a lot of people who do try Podman like it, which is good, but I don't think we should necessarily force them in that direction um, by removing it. Now, other options that we could possibly have are, um, you know, actually making a specific Podman machine version of FCOS that just removes some things, right? And so it's basically FCOS, but without a few packages. Uh, but it would be a separate thing to download, which is more overhead, right? But is it worth it, right? Is it worth it to reduce the size so that you don't get those pieces you don't want, right? Um, so it's all a balancing act, but that's that's another option too that we have. Uh, you know, one example is I use Silver Blue, but, uh, and I don't know if this is still the case, I remove Firefox from the base layer because I want to run it as a flat pack, right? Um, so we could do something like that if we thought it was uh, worth it to us to remove Moby Engine um, from a Podman machine version of Epcos, right? And it would actually show, oh, these, these packages have been removed, Um when you do an RPM OS tree status or something like that. But if they're concerned about the initial download size and the update download size, it doesn't sort of intentionally today, it doesn't help with that. Like, because yeah, the idea is you can still reset to that base image. I mean, the, the other thing, so my arguments against, against Moby engine are twofold. First, I think that Podman can provide the Docker CLI with the D-O-C-K-E-R adjective, and it can provide an API to satisfy Compose and, and other um, Docker calls. Now, will there be 100% correct? I, probably not, but you know we will be responsive to fixing those as opposed to taking two years to get off of Cgroups v2. Um, Second thing that happened is Kubernetes has dropped support for the Docker shim. So that changes the, the need for Kubernetes to have a at least Docker as a container engine uh, on the system. Now, maybe we could argue that container D still has to be there, um, but I'm not sure container D works well with multiple different... You know, I, I, I'm surprised that container D doesn't have the same issues that Cryo has with different versions of Kubernetes. Um, and right now, how, what who, what how do I get Kublet on top of Fedora Core OS? So um, just one thing to note here, uh, um, and uh, I'll leave the Dalton next, um, is that we have existing user using Docker uh, on the on Fedora Core. OS. So if we remove that at some point from the image, we have we need something to migrate them. Uh, from the current storage of all the container and everything that they have on the node to Podman. And that's something big, and I don't think we have that right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's one, go ahead. Yeah, I think maybe the other side of that coin is 
it doesn't seem like it's not even plausible to remove Docker CLI while Docker shim is in use until v122. So there's at least like a time required. Like at the absolute earliest would be when 122 is no longer, or 121 is no longer in use. It's like there's a substantial usage of the Docker CLI until viable container runtimes are available. I would, I don't necessarily care whether or not things are like bundled in or easily like able to layer in, uh, but it seems like the track record so far is that the like the layering approach is pretty hacky at the moment. So like, I would be super wary of of like, you know, if you're going to replace a major component that is like the reason people are using Fedora Core S, it has to be like a really good experience before, but like before any changes made like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like, first of all, we would want to get all of our technical ducks in a row and make it a really good experience. And even if we did that, it's still a hot button topic, right? Like container wars are a thing <laughs> and, uh, and trying to, you know, replace one with the other is, is a little bit of a lightning rod. Um, so yeah, it, it gets hard. So that's why I was suggesting, yeah. you know, maybe we make a separate deliverable specifically for Podman if, if that is like a deal breaker, right? I don't think it's a deal breaker. It just, again, the, the deal breaker is that you guys aren't in Synchronous V2 because of Moby Engine, and that drives me out of my friggin' mind. Um, so we, we, that, can that, that. we can fix yeah, that. We can fix that. That's, yeah. You can't fix his mind, not at all. Yeah. Uh, I just have a quick question because I'm, I'm not sure in my own mind. How, how does Fedora relate to RHEL? I mean, RHEL's gone and dropped Docker, right? And are, are we trying to stay in lockstep with Fedora? And, and Realm as far as what's being delivered in both platforms or not? I can speak to how Fedora Core OS re relates to RHEL Core OS, which is a somewhat different question. Um, RHEL Core OS is completely tied to the needs of OpenShift. So if OpenShift needs some glue that only makes sense in OpenShift context, we'll ship it in RCOS. If OpenShift doesn't need a component like Mobi Engine, we won't ship it in RCOS. Where FCOS is trying to fit a broader set of use cases. OKD is one of them. Um, and even there, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping to what uh, OCP is doing on our cost, but there are others as well. Um, another benefit for uh, Red Hat CoreOS versus Fedora CoreOS, even when running like Kubernetes or OKD, is that a specific version of our cost is only for a specific version of OCP. So they know the kubelet version, the, the container runtime version for cryo, all of these like pain points of like having all this genericness to be able to run like four versions of Kubernetes potentially, it, it can just ignore and it can say, this is it. You get this and only this. This is my only purpose. Right. So what is, uh, so but bottom line, Secret 3 2 to me is the biggest thing. The other one is the Intel stuff. So we can live, live with you keeping Mobi Engine around even if, we think it's a waste of time. Um, but I, I, the, the problem I think you guys are going to have in the future is you're going to have a huge upgrade problem. If you ever do want to drop Moby, you, know, you brought up a good point. It's like you guys have this database sitting there. How do you, how do you, you know, you might be running Moby Engine for the next 20 years. For, you know, yeah. You know, Unfortunately, so. and, you know, the time to drop Moby Engine or Docker, if we were going to do it, is when we created Fedora Core OS. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, we decided, obviously, we wanted to keep those users who would have chosen not to come with us if we had done that. But it might be it might be interesting to uh, I see. I, we could we could do somewhat of a conversion conversion with Podman from a Docker storage, but we couldn't convert the containers, I don't believe. So we could grab the we could move the images over fairly easily, but we couldn't move the container. So, all right, uh, Brent, is there anything else we talked about that you wanted to cover? We we have just before we have Benjamin and Colin with Res and and Stephen. So Benjamin first. Yeah, just a couple minor things. Um, there's been some discussion in terms of people upgrading from Container Linux, and that's true. But I. I think there's also the broader question of if someone's looking for a container operating system and they're bought into the Docker ecosystem, 
whether we could sell to them to try FCOS and also um, switch container runtimes at the same time. It, I don't know that we're that established yet in the in the container operating system space, and so it's not clear to me even for new users that we could that we could sort of start phasing out Docker. The other thing, as a practical matter, is just empirically, we haven't really had the cycles, the time to work on reducing the size of the OS. It, it, we're we're concerned about functionality. We're still working on uh, some networking use cases. We're still working on improving the installation flow to some extent. Um, so that as an argument for sort of prioritizing this, I think would sort of fall flat on that basis. It's obviously space is a thing we want to get to, uh, but like having a solid distro for users as so far empirically has been more of a priority. Yep. All right, Colin first, I think, and then Stephen. Yeah, uh, just what, so I know there was a conversation on thread at one point, like why don't we bake in everything? And I, and I guess one, like one pushback I wanted to, and I'll write this on a ticket, like one pushback I think I have on that is, you know, our current containers may not be, are definitely not the end of this space, right? Like there's Kata containers, you know, like there are people out there who are like, okay, I wanna like fully isolate my containers. And, you know, maybe Wasm makes a lot of progress and, you know, like there are people who wanna do a lot of Wasm stuff. And, you know, if we get to this world where it's like, okay, well, we need to bake in Kata and QMU and then it's like Wasm comes along and so we need that on the host. Like, I feel like that's a, that's a long-term losing strategy. Um, like. So we clearly, yeah, the reasons we have Docker have been described. Uh, it, removing Podman by default, I think would be, removing all of them by default seems like a step too far. I'm just, I, I guess I find myself leaning a little bit more towards let's polish a mechanism to extend and make sure we can lifecycle bind cryo and all that stuff and cover testing of those um, too, because like a huge gap in our whole testing matrix is like actually testing that extensions work. So. That's kind of where my head's at. Stephen? Yeah, um, I wanted to uh, follow up after Dusty's comment about it potentially being too late to remove things from the, the initial image. I, I don't think so. I, I think that there's a fair amount of it will still work on upgrades. So if you had an existing machine, it will keep working. And then as long as we provide a solid enough deprecation window and good enough messaging, I think it's fair to cut things out of the base image provided there's some not terrible workaround to get yourself back to that state if you need it. And if we can build this uh, UX around extensions or, or just improving package layering UX, so it's not like write a system D unit that does some bash script and then reboots. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, I, I think that that's at that point is fair to, to put out the messaging, Hey, in, the next version, uh, the next major version of Fedora, when the stable stream or when the testing stream gets there, we're going to yank Moby or we're going to yank X package. Here's how you get it back. And then we provide documentation on that. I think that that's sufficient personally. Yeah. I mean, especially if in the case of upgrades, for example, if you're upgrading a system from one that had Moby engine in there to one that didn't, and the system detected that, then it could convert it into an extension, right? And now it's just an extension that lives with that OS. So that user did not experience a, you know, uh, a, you know, downtime or whatever. It was just converted into an extension, and it just worked. Yeah, it definitely needs some thought and and some uh, <laughs> some communication. And we first of all have to decide if it's something that we even want to do, right? And then we can try to execute on it. All right, Christian. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, just because that came up, um, I want to. No, Christian, you're a bit loud, Christian. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just because it came up, uh, I, I want to just say that I'm strongly opposed uh, to removing Podman from FCOS because that would make uh, OKD installing OKD much more difficult, since we. <laughs> boot of course and then we use podman to actually um yeah extract stuff uh, so we do need podman in of course for okd right now um so I, I i'm opposed to removing that at least and i'm also um yeah i'm i'm in favor of removing moby and i think if we can find a way to kind of convert that into an extension that would be uh that would be great 
So Christian, uh, in the in the proposed idea that I had thrown out in the chat about removing all three, essentially, there would be a mechanism in ignition to say, I want Podman, and it would just install it during ignition time. So by the time that you get to the real route where the user would actually try and go and say, I want OKD, Podman exists at that point. And it's just not shipped in the okay, that, image. That will... It's just pulled seamlessly. Okay, that, that would actually work for us then. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of options here. We probably don't need to go down too far that because uh, I've I mean, got like yeah. three or four that I can discuss yeah. right now and we don't have time that, for that. I don't. Ha having that option also would solve the problem that Colin talked about where someone wants GVisor or they want, you know, I, I would like to get rid of run C off the off the platform and just use C run just again because it's twenty megabytes. It's you know, and they basically do the same thing and we default to C run now. Um and run Docker runs fine with C run. Um but yeah, lab K run in the future. There's there's lots of new OCI runtimes coming up. All right, Jeff and then Peter. All right, so it, it sounds like uh, we've got a person in the community who would like to get this change plumbed through Fedora Core OS, and they're approaching us and asking us for it. And I'm hearing a lot of um, ways that we potentially could do it and reasons for doing it and not doing it. Um, one of the real crisp takeaways that I'd like to get from this meeting is, are we willing to, at some point in the future, actually do something like this or should we just kind of set a baseline of we don't ever intend to do this can we can we reach that level of agreement in this call so i'll just speak here because i i said this at the beginning so the idea is just like to jump start discussion here and if we want to reach specific agreements or specific uh decision on on topics uh, that should happen in the tracker in or in the federal course meeting so um, feel free to to file issues, and we'll discuss there, and we'll bring that up, and and keep keep it going, and we'll convert the notes, the current notes, into into issues. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Hello. Um, yeah, I just uh, I, this is kind of uh, related to the topics before. I I'm um, Peter. I maintain Cryo and uh, package it and. Um, I was just going to say that the option that's been, kind of been being floated about like uh, dropping all or most of the container engines in favor of uh, like a good extensions um, mechanism uh, seems like the a, a fair and also like optically uh, more uh, like less um, dangerous than just saying okay we only support Podman and Cryo, um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that, but it, yeah. All right, I see Christian with your hand raised. Yeah. Yeah, and thinking about the optics, I'm I'm not as worried about that because we've kind of already ripped the bandaid off of the Docker thing. I, I would say, but um, yeah, maybe some community members really uh, want that and uh, rely on it. But I think as long as we can, can keep it working even as, as, as an extension, I think that would be enough. I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't see a problem with preferring Podman over Docker as, as, as a distribution. But that's just my, my opinion. Brent, was there anything else? I, you didn't hear my intro where I basically said the three pro, the three key issues I knew were Secrets V2, um, the size, the size of the image and uh, the arm, arm image. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? I think everything looked good. Um, um, there were a couple of uh, surprises in how the ignition file works, which 
we can debate whether that's a bug or working as designed, but we have a decent workaround. Uh, as, as Colin uh, correctly pointed out when we were looking at it, if we were to auto start uh, the Podman socket for the users and for root, then we wouldn't have this weird ignition file that has to go through and do all that. Um, and I think that's a valid point. I, I don't know. I don't know if Fedora would allow us to auto start for just FCOS and not Fedora, but uh, that's the only other thing. But again, we haven't really stressed other than just downloading, you know, getting the metadata, parsing it out, checking the SHA against something local, and booting it. That's about as far as we are right now. And can we connect to the socket, our socket? Um, Collins give me great links for, um, we need a mechanism to say that we're up and running. And they do similar for their testing, so he's given me a link on how to implement that. Um, so I think right now we're sitting reasonably pretty on that. Business as usual. Uh, quick question: Is there a link to like the source code for your stuff yet? Or? Uh, it's it's been proposed to main, and um, there was some convoluted issue with uh, the auto completion stuff that I I gotta go work on, but it should be merged here the next day or two. Uh, Colin, just look for the Podman machine pull request. It's all in there. It's a fairly large pull request, so it's going to take a, a lot of people yeah. having comments on it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We we have one last uh, topic that we wanted to discuss, uh, and uh, I guess I'll defer to Dalton for this one for the um, for the container runtime, if you would like to take it. Yeah, sure. So I filed this, I think, two weeks ago or so. So basically, there's this sort of timeline scenario where, like, obviously, Docker shim is going away. Uh, I know this group is, like, preaching all about, like, using all these other tools. But the reality of it right now is that there's, like, no materials on how to actually, like, which route to actually go. So this issue is trying to highlight this as, like, what container runtime or runtimes are like officially blessed because at this point we're kind of just community people are just making it up. Uh, it's like, do you sideload this thing? Do you configure this thing this other way? Do you sideload this other thing? It's kind of, I don't know, we're like super eager on getting rid of Moby it sounds like, but we're also sort of tossing our hands up in the air about how to get other container runtimes to work. Uh, I've vaguely poked at container D. Uh, I can maybe find time to also poke at cryo, but it doesn't feel like the best scenario for this to be done by random people poking at things in the community. Um, so I was really hoping we could come to more answers about container runtimes and like officially supporting and testing some of them. Um, and th I think that does tie into some of the layering stuff maybe, or some of the shipped by default types of discussions as well. And Dalton, you're talking about in the context of Kubernetes, right? Yeah, Kubernetes container runtime and the Docker shim deprecation window coming up. Well, okay. you have, a, for, from my perspective, we have a bunch of engineers who are pay, paid to maintain two container runtimes, and they will contribute to Fedora and and help fix issues that come up. And those are Cryo and and Podman. Community support for the others has to be done through community. Okay, so so with all those paid folks. We currently have like a random blog post, uh, actually Dusty's random comment describing how to install it, which thank you, very very helpful. And Containerd just happens to be there by chance. So that's kind of the, the current scenario right. for using Contain like actually using those it, two. Right, Containerd is just sucked in because it's part of Mo uh, Moby Engine. Yeah, coincidental. Um, Christian, go ahead. I think we have. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Christian. 
Yeah, I, I, I think this is more of a user experience problem, really, because we, we do have Cryo and it's, it is supported, um, but we can't easily install it on Fedora Core OS yet because it's only being released as an RPM module and RPM OS tree doesn't understand that metadata and can't pull it. Um, you can actually download it and install it manually um, with RPM OS tree. But obviously, that's uh, not a great user experience. So maybe that is uh, where we should kind of uh, improve the user experience and m maybe make RPM OS tree uh, understand modules or release Cryo as, uh, as a standard RPM, obviously, because we have the module, because we have different release streams of Cryo that may not be feasible, um, because you may want to be able to choose between versions. Uh, but yeah, if, if RPM OS tree understood uh, the module metadata and were able to pull from those uh, YAM repositories or module repositories, um, I think that would I think that would alleviate that issue, right? Then we could just have Cryo as a as an extension, and um, most people should be happy with that. I I'd say. Okay, Colin, and then Peter, and we are almost close to the top of the hour, so I'll keep the the recording going until for something like about 10 minutes probably and then we'll we'll call it uh call it off Colin? uh yeah i just say dalton i think you're absolutely right to call this out as a enormous gap um and one one thing i am hopeful we can do at some point is like I, i'd love to at least be able to have informing ci from typhoon and other groups using for core os like um because yeah, definitely like we just have a general gap with FCOS and upstream Kubernetes in general, right? And you know, I, I actually haven't even looked at what Typhoon CI is, but um, I think you know solving this problem is part of solving that problem too, um, and it would really make a lot of sense to do that. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave that there. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll definitely thank you for bringing this up. I uh, wasn't really thinking about um, the interaction with Fedora Core OS, and uh, so this is definitely, um, yeah, a useful perspective. I think um, from my perspective and from the perspective of the Cryo team, uh, I think we need a signal from the Fedora Core OS community about what the kind of the eventual path of installation is going to look like. I'm I'm kind of I'm happy to uh, and you know configure the cryo package in whatever way that um, is needed um, or work around like or morph what is currently existing in such a way that will work for Fedora Core OS. But I definitely uh, need some signal on the sanctified path of getting uh, a package that like definitionally has three supported releases at any given time. So it can't be like a sequential um, package. It, there has to be, you know, three versions that are downloadable at any given time. Um, I'm also happy to work with my team on, uh, and uh, like we also have someone who works on the Kubernetes release team. So I'm happy to work with him on like grouping together the Kubelet and Cryo and Cry tools, uh, all of these things so that there's like a sanctified, like let's make this Fedora Core OS node Kubernetes capable. Um, I'd love to see that, um, but yeah, I need the I need the direction um, before I can make any of those steps. All right, Daniel. Uh, based on following up on exactly what Peter um, just said, could could we just put the latest supported Kubernetes, the latest supported Cryo in Fedora mainstream, and you just anytime you update, you get whatever, you know, if that, if that changes, then it just gets updated. You know, why do we need, why don't we have those in the mainstream? Oh, one point that I will uh, use as a counter to that is the majority of consumers that I've seen uh, consuming cryo outside of OpenShift use the like last supported uh, Kubernetes release, uh, not the most recently released one, um, because the project generally moves pretty quickly. So um, I, I, it would be really, it would be much simpler just to package the latest one, but I have a, I have a guess that many users won't be pleased with uh, that as being the only thing that we have as a sanctified path of installation. Jonathan? 
Yeah, I'm, as much as I'm not a fan of the modularity effort in uh, Fedora, Fedora, in Fedora, it's basically made for this. Like that's what it's trying to solve. It's that exact problem we're having. So I think it makes sense to use uh, modules for this. And you know, yeah, we need to improve the UX there. And as Colin said, like we need to have good CI around this and be clear what versions of the module we support and sanity check that every time we do a, a release. Um, so if there's agreement on like the specific uh, streams we want to support, uh, we can hook that stuff up. The RPM industry um, issue, I think we could work around that or otherwise we'll just have to tackle it. But I don't think it's necessarily a hard blocker because RPM industry can fetch things from the uh, modular repos. It's just that it, like you said, Christian, it's not modularity aware, but it's still, it still can can read the YUM metadata. Yeah. So my my ideal, I guess, in this situation, yeah, I agree, um, Jonathan, that like the modularity UX uh, is not great in a lot of ways, um, but it is literally like that's why we adopted it despite all of the difficulties that we have with it is because it's literally uh for this purpose so uh ideally i would say like my 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 ideal is that there's first class support for module uh you know fedora modules in um in rpm os3 and then and then we can work together on configuring the packages per kubernetes release within that module and i think that will be that that is like the most idiomatic uh, path in from my perspective. Christian, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with that uh, because if, if we were to kind of uh, pin one version and say this is the version that FCOS ships that might create problems downstream for uh, Typhoon or OKD if, if those ver versions aren't the ones that are baked in. Um, so it, it's great to have modules to be able to choose from you know three different release streams that are supported and yeah i, I do agree this is exactly what modules uh, or modularity is supposed to solve so yeah making that ux uh better in rpm westry um i think that that would that's what i would uh go for here I, it doesn't have to be full support but yeah if, if we can just uh, make that a little bit easier i think that would be great Colleen, go ahead so out of a little bit of ignorance, like how bad is it to use the latest cryo with red on Kubernetes? Like, you know, I, I know when the whole cry was being churned out and all that stuff, I'm sure I'm assuming there was to, you know, stuff that needed to be version locked, but like, I guess that's my question is how much does it really need to be version locked today? Uh, the, it's, it's difficult because the CRI has not moved a lot in the past, like, Two years, but it has moved some, and uh, you know, like part of the cryo value proposition is that there doesn't have to be any ambiguity between differing versions of the CRI implementation and their kubelet. It's like it's a clear one-to-one -one relationship. So we have had situations where consumers have had to use n minus one cryo version um, because we've been slow about releasing um or and the opposite also um but uh we can't really make claims for supporting it because that kind of arbitrarily uh increases the support burden on us of like supporting well not arbitrarily because there's only three upstream supported releases but if we have to backport cri changes uh that far back or maintain backward compatibility compatibility with three releases that that's a higher support burden um, and also goes against like philosophically what cryo was initially created for All right Delton. yeah I don't really know the answer to that either I think it's gonna be really interesting around I think for all the problems of docker shim and how terrible it is there's also like it hasn't changed in forever so therefore no one has had to worry about the docker version in forever um, whereas with con we're about to like see the ecosystem move towards containerd and cryo or things like that, and maybe have to start caring about this. I would. I'm vaguely hopeful that if things are up to the CRI like 1.0 version standard, we can all just you know say like okay, it's 
good enough, Kubernetes is happy enough with it, but I don't know if that's actually going to pan out uh, like the thing that you're worried about, Peter, as well. We would probably be trying to do, of course, the latest Kubernetes as soon as it's released with whatever the latest cryo is and hoping for the best. And ContainerD is going to be doing the same thing on Flatcar, and I guess we'll see which ones work well. Uh, I, I don't know what, what will really, how much mitigating effort will be needed there to handle that. So it's hard to say. Yeah, and, and part of the trouble about this conversation is that like, yeah, the the Docker shim, like the world didn't have to worry about this version uh, problem because Docker shim was like never updated. And it, like, you know, it has been kind of abandoned upstream since the CRI existed and we never made that explicit. So like there is this awkward uh, like interaction now where that intention is now being made clear and all these end users are like, oh no, like this, this, I now have to think about this. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I think I, I, I like to think that the, I mean, the CRI is not even in version one yet. Like, I think that's going to happen in 122. Um, but it's in no way, it's not, it's not slowing down in development just because we're calling it V1. We're just calling it V1 because we probably should have three years ago and we should be on V3 now or something. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't wish to make any claim about Cryo's ability to support N minus three, um, good versions. I'm much more interested in the n plus, I guess, rather than n minus. Yeah. Well, and that's 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 even uh, harder, like backporting mm -hmm. all of that. I, I yeah, actually, that's that's a good point. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, one, well, yeah. Actually, maybe we're going backwards. I mean, Cryo is supporting a future version of Kubernetes that hasn't been released yet. It's hard to make guarantees about, but it's the thing that would right. be needed. Well, that I that is, I mean, I. I would hope that cryo is if we're updating Kubernetes as like a single release, you know, like, okay, 123 dot released. So we're like moving kubelet forward to that. I would hope that cryo would be there um, also. So I, I think like if we're only worried about the most recent release that uh, I, I don't expect us to take, you know, that long to upgrade cryo. Um, just to catch up to where the kubelet is far ahead of us. I'm worried about looking backward more. All right. Well, thanks for talking about the container runtime stuff. Yeah. All right. Do we have anything else to bring? I think we've covered a lot of topics, but. Uh, We'll still, uh, we'll still have a couple of minutes if we have a last thing to discuss. Otherwise, in any case, uh, we'll, so I will share the notes and um, I'll, I'll ask also, I'll try to write as much as I can into issue tickets. But of course, if you can create ones with the specific stories or add your comments in the tracker, that would be helpful. And uh, yeah. Dalton, you still have your own help. Do you want to say something or not? <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> no worries. All right. Thanks, guys. Great seeing everybody again. Or well, the ones that I know, anyways. Thanks, thanks Dalton. Yeah. Welcome cool. back, Dustin. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Right, thanks. Yeah. thanks, everybody.